Well, thank yes. you, Chandan, for, for uh, inviting me to give this uh, talk. So to keep up with the informal nature of this uh, presentation, let me spend a few seconds at the beginning with <clears throat> going over my background. So as you can see from this uh, title slide that uh, my undergrad was in civil engineering. And that was a very different world compared to what I'm doing now. But uh, what I liked, the, one of the few courses that I liked in civil engineering was hydraulics, which is basically fluid mechanics. And then I applied for graduate school in fluid mechanics. I did my PhD from Virginia Tech in theoretical fluid mechanics, which I loved uh, the nature of the work, but I gradually realized that I need to train myself in uh, other tools as well, beyond theory. And I took the first postdoc position in Japan, where I, uh, uh, where the work was related to experimental fluid mechanics. And I soon realized that I'm not tailor-made for experiments. I don't like waking up in the morning and go to a lab and uh, do the setups. So I wanted to move out of experiments. And then I took a second postdoc position at uh, UNC Chapel Hill, where uh, I had to first teach myself uh, CFD. And I started working. So this was a position with the medical school. So uh, I was involved in a number of projects where uh, I collaborated with the physicians. Uh, we developed uh, fluid mechanics models of uh, our inhaled airflow, for example, in the nose, or maybe the airflow in the throat. We looked at uh, drug delivery as well in those uh, regions. So that's how, uh, from civil engineering in the undergrads, I came to the world of medical science. Uh, the connecting link is fluid mechanics. So I'm using fluid mechanics tools uh, to answer different types of interdisciplinary questions. So with that background, uh, today I'm going to talk about a number of uh, sub-projects that I have where I'm using fluid mechanics uh, for different topics in medical science, more specifically for this lecture today, uh, we are going to look at problems in uh, respiratory transport. So with this, let, let me go into the main uh, material. So in terms of the, the overall theme of uh, research in my group, I'd like to uh, classify it into two tracks. So first, uh, I'm going to discuss about track one, which in my mind, it is more related to the translational application of fluid mechanics. Uh, I'd come to track two at the end. Track two is more about uh, exploring the fundamental fluid mechanics of the basic flow physics uh, nuances in these problems. So let's go into track one first, which again is on translational applications. And uh, therein, uh, as you can see from this tiny little squares in there, uh, I have a number of uh, smaller projects. Uh, today, we are going to just look at two or three of them. And uh, I'm going to start with uh, the first red one, which is on nasal drugs, or more specifically on topical nasal sprays. And before I go into that, again, I would uh, repeat what Chandan said. If you have any questions, just uh, feel free to stop me and then we can discuss at length. So the first project that I'm going to discuss is on nasal drugs. <clears throat> now, irrespective of whichever project I might discuss, in general, when I'm using the fluid mechanics uh, analysis tools in uh, this kind of clinical domains, we typically always start from uh, the medical imaging data. It can be CT scans, it can be MRI data. Uh, we use those scans to build uh, models that are anatomically realistic. So as for example here, you can see this CT scan slice at the top right. Uh, so typically we collect uh, around 250 to 300 such slices. If we are trying to uh, restructure, reconstruct the, the nasal airway of a person, and uh, we get those scans and we digitally stack them up to build models that look like the ones that you see in the bottom. And once we have the geometry, then the next thing to think about is, uh, which particular question we want to address as part of some project. So for this step, I typically uh, talk to the clinicians because they are the best people to know what are the open problems right now in medical science. So in this particular project, uh, the clinical condition that we are looking at is chronic rhinosinusitis or CRS. It's a very common condition. It, it uh, involves some facial pain, uh, loss of smell, a feeling of obstruction in the nose, and uh, if you want to think of it in terms of the medical uh, imaging, uh, the two scans at the bottom, so the one on the left, it is from a person who is healthy. And uh, those dark areas at the 
So in at, at the center, those are the main nasal passage, and on the sides and at the top, they are the sinus cavities. Uh, they are attached like appendages to the main nasal passage, and you can see they are dark, implying that they are uh, clear, and there is not much mucus buildup. But if you go to the scan on the top right, you can see that uh, those two big sacs on the two sides, uh, they are the maxillary sinuses, by the way, and you can see that they have uh, some congestion. Uh, there is some mucus buildup in those sinuses, and also there is some congestion in the main nasal passage as well. So that is uh, a scan that we obtained from uh, a person suffering from CRS. Now let's think of what are the possible uh, treatments available for this uh, condition. So in general, there are three uh, possible avenues. Uh, so the first line of treatment are the topical nasal sprays. If that doesn't work, the doctors typically recommend uh, orally administered corticosteroids. If that doesn't work, then the eventual uh, option is to go for uh, some corrective surgeries, which uh, can help to ease the flow of air into the person's nose. Now for this project here, we are not going to talk about the corticosteroids or the surgeries. We are going to think about the topical nasal sprays and try to figure out if there is a way to improve their therapeutic performance. So here we are just talking about the nasal sprays. Now, if we are just thinking about the nasal sprays, and uh, we are also thinking about using tools from fluid mechanics to understand or to address this question on how to improve the uh, spray performance, to keep the project realistic or to keep the data that we generate realistic enough, we need to figure out what are the parameters in the currently available uh, uh, sprays that are out there. So for many of my projects, I collaborate with uh, other groups with uh, different kinds of expertise. So for this part, component of this particular project, I uh, work with a drug development company called Next Breath. They're also based in the US, uh, they're in Maryland. So what I did was uh, purchase a few over-the-counter spray bottles from different makes, and I shipped them to, to, to them, uh, this company called Next Breath, and they measured uh, using laser diffraction techniques, they measured different parameters about the, about the sprays. For example, what should be the size distribution of the droplets uh, in the spray shot that is coming out, or what is the plume geometry of the spray shot, or what might be the initial speeds of the droplets of the particles that are coming out of the nozzle, those kind of things. And we can, once we get that information from, from uh, this company, we can impose that into our simulations. So let's now think about the simulations that we have to handle. In this project, or in many of my projects, I tend to think of uh, the simulation component in two layers. The first layer is, uh, let's think about what is going on uh, over here. We are applying sprays into the nose, and uh, while doing so, the doctors typically recommend you to breathe in gently. So there is the ambient airflow that is being inhaled as well. So the first layer of simulation here is uh, replicating that uh, breathing process. And uh, based on whatever flow rate we want to simulate, of course, you guys know that, or, or people who are from the fluid mechanics background, you know that it can be a laminar process or a turbulent process. Now, uh, sometimes uh, based on whichever CT scans we are using, if we had collected the breathing measurement data from that corresponding subject, then we try to replicate that particular breathing rate. Otherwise, there is enough data in literature where they correlate uh, the weight of a particular individual, which we, which we typically record whenever we recruit a new person into our study. So if we have the data on the weight of that person, uh, there is some formulation out there, uh, allometrically scaled, which helps us to figure out what should be the target breathing rate for that particular individual. So we simulate that breathing rate, and uh, after that, the next step is tracking the particles. In this particular case, the spread uh, particles from the nasal spray. Uh, we use discrete uh, phase uh, tracking, and uh, the equation uh, includes effects from the drag force that is uh, induced by the surrounding airflow on these particles. There is the effect of gravity, and there is the softman lift force, which is uh, generated by the flow field uh, transverse to the direction of strain flow on these tiny particles. So eventually, the, the overall output from this component of the work are the regional delivery numbers in different regions of the of the nasal model, right? So we track where uh, in the internasal space or which parts of the internasal walls different particles are landing. So that is the overall output, but let's now think deeper into the question that we are trying to answer. 
is there a way to improve this this target express uh, with this question let's think a bit about the basic fluid mechanics here so uh, uh, here i have shown the trajectories for two representative particles on the left uh, we have the five micron particle and uh, if you look at it uh, that small tiny red circle uh, is the point where the inertial motion of that five micron particle has stopped and whatever it does beyond that point is because of the airflow streamline on which it was embedded at that point on the other hand if you look at the picture on the right uh, here i have tracked a 25 micron particle it is somewhat heavier than a five micron particle so it has a stronger inertial motion that uh, will persist uh, a bit longer and eventually it uh, gets deposited at the roof of the nasal passage where we have the ethmoid sinuses so the moral of the story here is the inertia of the particles uh, what is the initial direction of the particles that can play a huge role in uh, figuring out where they might land as well and there might be a possibility to use this kind of uh, trend uh, to uh, improve targeted delivery of this kind of drug particles so with this observation uh, let's think again about the question that we are trying to explore and since we are trying to improve the performance let's now figure out how these sprays are supposed to be used now we are not changing anything about how the formulations in this sprays are designed or anything like that we are just trying to figure out is there a, another alternative way to use those sprays to improve their performance and to answer that we need to know how it is being used right now so for this you can look at the instructions that come uh, with this over-the-counter sprays or uh, uh, we can talk to the doctors as well so typically the patients are recommended to lean forward a little while applying the spray and the spray bottle should be held vertically upright while doing so and it should be just inserted into the nose so these are the instructions that come with the package now uh, since we are trying to address this question through fluid mechanics we have to find a schematic way uh, to replicate this in the in silico world and and run some simulations to figure out what might be the drug delivery for this particular uh, usage protocol which by the way i'm calling as uh, current use or cu so the picture on the right uh, shows you how i have interpreted these instructions so i have inclined the digital head forward by an angle of 22.5 degrees the spray bottle is held vertically upright and it is inserted by a through a shallow depth of five millimeter into the intranasal space and uh, as i said this is the cu protocol and i can simulate how the and, and uh, how the sprays are going to uh, deposit in different parts of the nasal model with this particular usage direction so this is cu now the next part of the question is how to improve on that to improve on that we need to know a bit more about this particular clinical condition so we are talking about crs and uh, uh, which is a kind of chronic uh, sinus disease and we talked to the doctors as i showed at the very beginning uh, from those scans that in crs you have uh, mucus congestion in uh, the different sinus cavities and we know that there are multiple types of sinus chambers for example over here uh, the the sacs numbered one they are the biggest ones they're the maxillary sinus then number two is uh, okay so number two is something else number three is ethmoid sinus which is sort of like at the roof of the nasal passage four is the frontal sinus which is right below the forehead and there is uh, if you think about this i don't think you can see my pointer on the screen but uh, the bulb like cavity at the very end that's called the sphenoid sinus and i have not marked it here but in general there are four different kinds of sinuses so in crs uh, the mucus uh, congestion would be there in these four types of chambers but it is not possible to send our drug particulates to all these four different destinations right so we have to figure out a compromise we have to figure out a common site uh, that might be effective for all these different sinuses so at that point i talked to the clinicians and they suggested that this region which is marked by the uh, the blue circle uh, is it is called the osteomital complex or omc so omc is the zone where all the sinus cavities they drain their fluids into and it is also the main airflow exchange corridor in the in the nasal passage so if you can see send more drugs to that region chances are more drugs would percolate into the sinus chambers so that is going to be a, our target site for uh, improving the performance of nasal sprays the next thing to figure out is okay so we have a target site now that is the omc 
can we at all see it from outside of the nose? It is difficult to test this in a real uh, person because then we have to uh, obtain a number of permissions. So I 3D printed a nose. I made it out of uh, a material which is similar to uh, a real nose. So I have the same model here, if you can see. So it is soft like a real uh, nasal tissue. And I used a speculum and that blue chunk in there is the region where the OMC is. So indeed it is possible to see the OMC, which is the target site uh, from outside. So now the idea is to use the inertia of the particles. To do that, uh, I propose that let's orient the spray bottle such that the spray axis would cut through the OMC. And you can see that from the cartoon at the top right. And I call this as the line of sight protocol. Uh, I call it uh, so because I can now directly see the OMC from outside. So the idea now is to compare between the CU protocol, which is already existing, and this new LOS protocol, a line of sight protocol. I tested the hypothesis that uh, LOS would improve drug delivery on a trial subject first, and that is the data at the very bottom. I saw that uh, the drug delivery increases by almost eight folds in that particular individual. So that helps, uh, that, that promises that this can be a good way to reorient the spray bottle, but we have to look at other subjects as well, right? So I included four other subjects. In total, in this study, I have five subjects, and in all of them, I see this improvement. The average improvement is still eightfold, but the range of improvement is uh, two to 16 folds, which is still very promising. But before we can uh, uh, be very sure about this uh, improvement, we also have to validate the CFD model, because whatever we have done until now is in the computational world. So for that, uh, I 3D printed some of the anatomic uh, models and I worked with another group. I don't do experiments, so for the experiments, I have to always collaborate with others. So what they did is take a nasal spray, spike it with a mildly radioactive uh, element called technetium, and they would apply the spray into that 3D print. And they can, then once the spray solution they have deposited along the walls of the of the model, they can quantify the deposits through the radioactive signals that are coming out from those uh, from those droplets that are on the walls. And uh, the way I compare the CFD data with the experiments is like this. So I, if you uh, look at the top row, I have broken up, virtually broken up the in silico model into these vertical compartments. So I first have the sagittal columns and then the frontal columns and then horizontal compartments, the sagittal rows and I can extract the, the predicted drug delivery from the CFD from each of these compartments and compare that with the corresponding signals from the experimental data. I do this comparison. Uh, so again, uh, I have the comparison for the sagittal columns, the sagittal rows and the frontal columns. And on the horizontal axis for each of these plots, I have the different compartment ID numbers. And uh, you can see that uh, the deposition mass fractions are not exactly similar between the experiment, which is in yellow here, and the CFD data, which is in blue here. But still, the trend is sort of agreeable. And hence, I did a rank correlation test, and uh, the coefficient comes out to be more than 0.9. So we can assume that uh, there is good agreement between the CFD and the experiments here. So with this, this concludes the first project that I wanted to discuss. So what is what is the general outcome? So we have proposed a different way to use the nasal spray, which can be replicated very easily because the clinicians can uh, directly uh, recommend to the patients right in the, in the during the clinic visit that this is how you should hold the spray bottle inside your nose, and that would give you a better drug delivery, which might be which might increase the targeted delivery by almost eight folds. So that is great. Secondly, uh, this kind of findings can also help the drug development companies to improve uh, the physical parameters of their solution to uh, increase the targeted delivery based on whichever clinical condition that they're trying to uh, address. So this is the first project that I wanted to discuss. Uh, again, feel free to uh, stop me if you have any questions. Uh, but if not, I'm going to go into some of the other projects. We are still on the track one, which is on translational applications. So the I wanted to like I was curious that um, the three D printed models that you use for the experiments, right? So uh, were they based on uh, some of your subjects that you tested? Yes, yes. So 
this particular uh, uh, example that I show here is uh, one of the five subjects that went into this study. I see. Okay. Yeah. And the other thing, like, could you please elaborate, like, uh, how you actually estimated the correlation? Okay. Like, so the uh, from the uh, CFDN experiment. Right. So, so for example, if you think about all these different compartments from the CFD, if you post-process the data, you can get the, the mass deposits from each of these zones, right? So suppose, mm -hmm. uh, 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 let's imagine uh, we are thinking about C11, C10, and C9. So let's imagine that we get X, Y, Z as the mass deposits in three, in three of these compartments. I look at the corresponding compartments in the, in the experimental data. And we see the trend. So if X, Y, Z, if, if, if suppose Y is better than X and Z, if we see the similar kind of trend over here. So we do a rank order correlation in terms of, say from smallest to the highest or highest to the smallest. And we try to check if that order is, is, is similar. Of course, they are not going to be exactly similar, but we found that the coefficient is uh, more than 0.9. Yeah, we have another question from Manas. Ma uh, Manas, please feel free to you know, unmute yourself and ask the question. Okay, uh, th uh, thank you very much. Uh, your presentation was very interesting. Uh, I, I have two questions. The first being, uh, what is the process you use to generate the uh, see a computational model from the CT scan? Is it like a uh, manual process where you use some sort of a software and do manually uh, uh, like smoothing or this kind of stuff to create a good enough geometry or is it an AI or something uh, based mod method to create the geometry? And the second question is, uh, why is a steady state flow condition uh, considered for, for the inhalation? These are two questions, thank you. Okay, okay. So to answer your first question, no, we are not using any kind of AI here. So we get the scans in the DICOM format. Uh, we bring them into a software package called Mimix. I think there is another software that you can use called Slicer, uh, but we, we typically use Mimix. And uh, initially we can, uh, based on the radio density on those images, uh, we can uh, create some kind of threshold to get the bulk of the air uh, space into the solid model. Uh, but then after that, my knowledge of anatomy is not that great, so I work with the clinicians uh, in the team, and uh, uh, they help us in uh, improving the, the anatomic realism of those geometries. So they would go through each of those 250 or 300 such slices and, 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 and correct uh, the pixels on those scans. And that's how we build the geometry. So we get uh, uh, feedback from the physicians that the geometries that we come up with are, are, are clinically realistic. So that answers your first question. Uh, what was the second question again? Uh, in the uh, uh, in the state, uh, uh, yeah, right. So, so for the steady state assumption, the thing is if you, yeah, of course, if you are trying to uh, simulate the breathing process over a certain duration of uh, time, it is not a steady process, right? It, it is, first of all, it is periodic. And secondly, even if you just consider uh, one half cycle, so just inhalation or exhalation, uh, it is it is realistically unsteady in nature. However, yes. uh, the kind of uh, time domain that we are trying to simulate, especially if we are thinking about uh, relaxed steady breathing in the sense that the person is sitting and, and uh, breathing at a very uh, low rate, uh, that delta T amount of time, you can assume in all probability that the flow features are going to be steady uh, because it's around 0.2 to 0.3 seconds at most. Uh, okay. But of course, if you are trying to simulate on a wider time interval, it makes sense to, of course, uh, steady would be a too, too stretched of an assumption in that case. Okay, okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay, so next we go to Vikas. Uh, please unmute yourself and you can ask the question. Uh, uh, I'm not having option to unmute myself, so I'm asking on the behalf of Prashant. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Please. Okay. Uh, I want to know. Can you suggest me some open source uh, resources for this uh, kind of data set, uh, whether it is CT scan or MRI scan? Uh, I don't have anything at the top of my head right now. But I. So typically we don't. Uh, so uh, for example, in terms of the imaging data, we don't use open source data. We are recruiting the subjects in a medical school and uh, we are building models for them and we know their clinical history. 
But okay. uh, I know that there are some repositories out there. Uh, uh, if you're interested, I can look it up because I I remember reviewing a paper a few months back, and there uh, the group uh, they were using uh, some some open access sources to gather the scans. Uh, the problem with okay. those kind of sources is uh, I had looked at them briefly a few months back for another project. The thing is, it's mm -hmm. difficult to get the the some of the information that you always need for realistic simulations. For example, what is the breathing rate, or even if you are trying to publish the data, what is the ethnicity of the person, or what is the gender? Those kind of information sometimes seem to be lacking. But I, yes. I, I know that there are some online sources out there where you can get uh, some scans. Yeah. Yeah, and my second question is: uh, uh, you, Have you considered the wall as a rigid wall, or uh, are you considering the motion of the wall also? No, this is a rigid wall. So that is one of the uh, simplifying constraints that we have, and that is, and and uh, once I finish this talk, you will see that there are many open uh, ends uh, to this line of research, and and uh, right now we cannot really simulate uh, the dynamic uh, aspect of the breathing process. Uh, and these are all rigid walls, but but these are great questions. So uh, this this area is going to be active for the next 10, 20 years. So there is a huge scope to improve the modeling tools. One of which is 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 not considering these walls to be rigid. There is another simplifying assumption here. We don't have the so we know that in the nasal passage there is the mucus coating, there is the ciliary hairs. Those kind of details are not there in this uh, modeling framework yet. So there is a tremendous scope to improve. This modeling platform okay thank you so much okay so we'll take the question of suman suman please go ahead uh, hi, uh, uh thank you uh, thanks Shannon. uh thank you Shoshita, for the wonderful talk so far uh, just a small question following up on what you mentioned a few moments back uh the time scale of the problem being in the range of 0.1 to 0 0.5 seconds is that something that you get from uh, like the doctors or the physicians based on their experience and what's uh, usually the computational cost or computational effort for running the simulations okay so in terms of the time scale uh, uh see if i look at the spray the the exit speed of these particles that are coming out look at that this number it's it was 19.2 meters per second for that particular spray uh, typically the numbers tend to be always uh, greater than 10 meters per second so think about a particle that is coming out at that kind of speed and uh, think about the length that it has to traverse before it can reach, in this case, uh, the target set, which is OMC. So it's not that long of a distance. So uh, the time scale was obtained as an estimate by us, not from the doctors. Uh, typically, we know the time scales of breathing because uh, on an average, we, uh, I think there is a number for how many times we breathe in a minute. It should be around, uh, 15 or so, uh, the entire cycle. So there would be like 15 complex cycles in a minute. So we can, of course, uh, calculate those time scales. But here we are talking about how long these this particles, these rock particles, are going to be airborne. And that is a very, very short time interval. So that answers the first question. So your second question, can you repeat that again? Uh, what's the computational cost for your simulations? Like how much okay. time does so for, uh, for example, so that depends on the, the kind of uh, numerical scheme that we are using. If it's a laminar, uh, we don't uh, use any kind of supercomputer, by the way. So we are uh, using ANSYS and we are using parallel processing on, on just work sessions that we have in the lab. So for the laminar uh, simulations, it takes around four or five hours. Uh, for tabular simulations, we typically use LES. That can take around three days to four days. And if the problem is simple enough and if you are confident that we can just use RANS, then that would take around 12, 13 hours. Okay. Um, thank you. Yeah. Okay, so we have another question from Manus. Yeah. Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah. Hello? Yes, I can hear you. Yeah. Uh, no, I'm asking Manus. Do you want to ask the question, or is it the previous hand raised? Sorry. Uh, okay. Uh, I I didn't know. Oh, sorry. Did I raise the hand again? <laughs> I think it's. Okay. Okay. Story. Anyway, so uh, so you got the, I have a follow up question to Suman. So um, about the spray speed, there is that is something like clinically observed, and uh, and we do not have really control about. 
but then how do you control your you know cfd solver setup for the convergence so from the you know the time history or i mean the flow uh, output or flow field variables that we uh, obtain from cfd simulation so after what is the time scale after which they get converged normally this is just uh you mean the time scale in the simulation right so yeah so since you are considering steady state so like after how many time step or iterations like normally so, if you think about, uh, so let's think about the steady state let's think about uh, the laminar simulation so i'll give you some sample examples so if we are uh, trying out 5000 iterations we typically see stabilization from around uh, i would say 1000 or 2000 iterations on an average and if okay. we see that the residuals have stabilized we might not even go till 5000 uh but that is a typical number yeah and that can uh, but, vary from one subject to another yeah what is yeah so what is the uh, minimum time step that you have gone for yet i mean just for a number let's say uh the, the minimum time step, so, uh, for example it is around for the LES simulations right now based mm -hmm. on how uh, what delta t we are trying to simulate i have a time step of around point zero 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 one second Ten minutes. okay okay thank you yeah. there is no question uh, no more question at this stage please go ahead yeah. okay okay so let the other uh, projects are going to be relatively smaller compared to the discussion in the previous one because i wanted to cover more details on that one to give you an overall flavor of the modeling framework now this one is for nasal surgeries uh, fluid mechanics can also help us figure out what would be a good surgery for a particular individual and uh, here i am again looking at a particular clinical condition called nasal valve collapse where the opening to the nose gets constricted and there are three main surgical uh, corrective procedures for this so these are the cartoons that we have here the first one on the left is the butterfly graft where the implant is placed transverse to the direction of the flow then i have the spreader graft where the implant is longitudinal and then the third one is a lateral graft where it is similar to spreader but uh, here the implant is bio absorbable on the on, on the very right now uh, the spreader grafts have been around for a while butterfly graft uh, this technique was developed over the last 20 years or so and lateral graft the one on the very right it's really new it's around two three years old so the question is to to correct the anatomy for nasal valve collapse which one would be the best procedure and uh, here again i worked with the clinicians what they did is collect a number of cadaveric heads they carried out this surgery all three types of surgery in each of those heads and they collected scans both pre-surgery and post-surgery and we used the scans to build our geometries and then we ran some airflow simulations the main quantity that we post-processed from the data is the airflow resistance which can be computed as the pressure uh, drop that is driving the flow divided by the flow. and we see that with the butterfly graph post-surgery the improvement in the airflow resistance is almost 34 percent and this is from a cohort of around 15 cadaveric heads uh, the spreader graft and the lateral graft their performance is very similar but lateral did somewhat better so at least for these 15 subjects we can tell that butterfly graft works uh, more efficiently in terms of helping the flow of air through the nose compared to the other two techniques but what is the general moral here the general uh, storyline here is this we can use cfd we can use fluid mechanics uh, in a number of different ways. As for example here, if a clinician has recommended a medical scans or CT scans to a particular individual, we can use our modeling framework to develop a full visual of the airflow patterns, the drug delivery trends, the outcomes for different uh, nasal surgeries by using virtual surgeries into this, this uh, in silico geometries. And we can have that data available to the clinician, which can help in the uh, follow-up diagnosis or it can help in figuring out what could be the best type of drug for that particular individual or what could be the best surgical process for that individual so this can be the next uh, layer of how engineering can mesh well with medical science and this would create a platform for more personalized healthcare. 
So that is one topic that I wanted to cover. Let's now move into something which is somewhat different. And uh, this line of my research essentially took off over the last one year, uh, of course, with the outbreak of COVID. Uh, but as you can see from my projects, I have been working in this kind of nasal transport process for the last five, six years. So COVID-19 being primarily a nasal disease, uh, it helps to have that background and answer some questions that we are facing right now. And uh, as of now, I have collaborations related to COVID-19 research with a number of uh, clinicians and a number of pharmaceutical companies. And we are also involved in drug development in, uh, well, by drug development, I mean some therapeutics that can help in relieving the condition. We are also working on intranasal vaccines. Uh, but for the discussion here, I'm going to talk about the project that I started on my own last year to figure out what we know that SARS-CoV-2 is an airborne transmission, right? So the question that I started out from, and this is, I would say, around April of last year. Okay, so if it is an airborne transmission, which are the bad droplet sizes? We know that uh, in the air, the droplet sizes that we eject uh, uh, through breathing or talking can be anywhere between uh, 0.1 microns to 500 microns. But what are the bad sizes over here? To answer that question, I had to again fall back on the literature that was coming out at that point, and it is still coming out. And there have been a number of studies which looked at how this infection starts. So I have just cited one example here. This came out on cell. Uh, they looked at how the infection uh, uh, progresses, and they saw that the infection starts in the ciliated epithelial cells, uh, which are more abundant on the upper airway. And these cells, they have a certain kind of protein called ACE2, which the, the, the virus uh, uses to intrude into the cells. So these cells are uh, more abundant, as I said, in the upper airway. But if you think about the upper airway, uh, there is also uh, this conjecture that uh, there is a thick layer of mucus in the anterior cavity. So a number of groups, and that includes me as well, they, we have posited that uh, the initial dominant infection site for, for SARS-CoV-2 is this red zone over here called nasopharynx because in the anterior parts, there is too much of mucus, which, which provides some kind of preventive layer or protective layer against uh, the virus invasion. So the infection is dominantly starting out from the nasopharynx. So if that is the case, can we figure out the droplet sizes that will directly land at the nasopharynx through the process of inhalation? So with that overall uh, hypothesis and to answer this question, let's now go into the actual work that I did. I ran a number of uh, inhalation simulations and I uh, varied the airflow rate from 15 to 85 liters per minute. Now 15 liters per minute is something that we are breathing in when we are just sitting steady. Uh, 85 liters per minute is too high of a spectrum. It is typically what we would be breathing when we are running or breathing in forcefully. And uh, I chose these particular numbers because these are also the numbers that uh, uh, biomedical device companies use to test the filtration on, on respirators or uh, face coverings or masks. So I ran the breathing simulations through all these different uh, inhalation rates. And then I ran some particle transport simulations as well, or droplet transport simulations. And I see that for targeted landing at the nasopharynx, the typical size range for those particles, if I just look at the average data over the entire spectrum of different breathing rates, that size range is from 2.5 to 19 microns. And one critical thing to note here is, uh, here the density of these droplets is 1.3 gram per ml. Why? Because these are the droplets that are ejected from someone who already has that infection, right? So it's made from respiratory ejector. And we know that uh, those respiratory droplets are formed uh, from sputum. Sputum has 99.5% water. But once those droplets come out into the air, they undergo environmental dehydration. So out of that 99.5% water, much of the water would vaporize off. What would remain are the other remnants which are non-volatile, and that includes the virus as well. So the density would increase appreciably to around 1.3 gram per ml, which is again an average number that comes from other papers. So for this particular density, we see the size range, the bad size range is 2.5 to 19 microns for delivery at the nasopharynx. One may ask the question, uh, what if uh, the, the, the geographic region that we are thinking about 
it has a high humidity. So what if it is, uh, for example, India? So if the humidity is high, the environmental dehydration would be low, or yeah, it would be very low. And what would happen as a result that uh, sputum, which was 99.5% water initially, uh, the water won't be vaporized off. And as such, the, the droplets that the exposed individual is going to inhale would be similar to water droplets. And over here in these simulations, I hence maintain a density of one gram per ml. And even with that, I see that the, the hazardous size range uh, does not change much. So from 2.5 to 19 microns, it gets re revised to 3 to 20 microns. So the droplets are still of the very, of, of somewhat similar sizes. So with this, uh, I think we have answered the question that we started out from. So what are the bad droplet sizes? The bad droplet sizes are somewhere in between 2 to 20 microns, or 3 to 20 microns. And that can actually help us in many different ways. That can help us to come up with better designs for uh, new kinds of face coverings that will just screen these bad particulates out. And hence, in the process, they can be more breathable than the N95 masks that we have, which actually try to screen even particles which are as small as 0.1 or 0.2 microns. So that answers the first question. The second question that I was exploring for the last few months is what is the infectious dose? Some of you might know what is an infectious dose. Infectious dose for a viral condition is defined uh, like this. It is a number of variants that can go on to start an infection. So we know these numbers for the different flu viruses, but this is still a very important open question that we have for SARS-CoV-2. We don't know how many virus particles or how many variants we need to inhale to get sick. So to address that question, I was again looking at literature and the papers that were coming out. This is a very important article that came out uh, on PNAS. Here they uh, tried to figure out what is the probability that a droplet of a certain size would carry at least one virion. So for example, they found that for a 10 micron droplet, if it is undehydrated, so there has not been any environmental vaporization yet, then the chances that that 10 micron droplet would have at least one variant is just 0.37%. If on the other hand, the size is three microns, the probability to carry at least one variant is around 0.01%. So I decided to develop a simple mathematical uh, framework to test these numbers. And to, in the process of developing that framework, I again had to read some more papers on virological assessments. And this is one paper that came out on Nature last year. So this is a German group. They collected virological data from a group of hospitalized COVID-19 patients. Uh, they figured out the RNA viral load in their sputum. And this SARS-CoV-2 is a single-stranded RNA virus. So we can assume that one milliliter of oral ejecta would have that many number of variants, seven times 10 to the power of six, and hence a droplet that is being formed from that ejecta. If it is of size D micron, then this capital N would be the number of variants embedded in that droplet. In other words, to come across one variant in these droplets of D micron size, we have to test N inverse number of droplets. And we can put this in terms of probability as uh, one over small n, percentage. So this one over small n of the p uh, function over here is a function of uh, the size of the droplet d. If we plug in the value of d into that equation, we can see that p is 0.01% for 3 micron size and 0.37% for 10 micron size, which matches almost exactly with the numbers that were reported in the other article. So with this modeling framework, I'm going to use uh, this third equation where we calculated how many variants are there in a droplet of a certain size and couple that with the CFD data that we have on which are the bad droplet sizes, which are the sizes that are depositing at the nasopharynx. So I link these two data and I figure out that if you are exposed, if I am exposed to an individual with an average viral load, uh, I am going to inhale uh, around 11 variants that are going to land directly at the nasopharynx over a duration of five minutes. But on the other hand, if the infected individual has peak viral load, I can inhale as many as 3,800 variants over five minutes that are going to directly deposit at the nasopharynx. So with this data, we can look, we, we can look at other super spreading incidents that have been reported over the last one year to figure out what was the exposure time during those uh, incidents. And I can come up with a number 
which might lead to the start of this infection. So the exact number that I cal calculated in my work is around 300. And right now there are other papers that are coming out as well. Most of them are preprints at this point. Uh, they are pre projecting similar numbers as well. Uh, for example, one of these papers, they said their number is 280. So which is great because we typically just want to come up with the order of magnitude estimate. And to put this in perspective of uh, what about the other viruses? So for example, for influenza A virus, the number of variants you need to inhale to get sick is around 2000 to 3000. So this shows that SARS-CoV-2 is almost 10 times more contagious than a flu A virus because the order of uh, the infectious disease is just one order smaller. Okay, so that I think wraps up the, the projects I wanted to discuss in terms of the translational applications. I can pause here for a moment. I have around 10 minutes of talking time left in terms of the material I want to cover. If you have any questions, you can ask me now or I can move on. So, yeah, so do you guys have any questions? Please feel, feel free to ask. Okay, so let me just wrap up the talk and then we can discuss uh, a bit more. Sure. So, see, so on the track two, I think about the, the basic fluid mechanics that uh, might uh, be uh, impacting this kind of transport processes. So for example, let's think about the vortex dynamics. We know that vortices, they have a low pressure at their centers and it is possible for them to trap the drug particulates which can mess up targeted drug delivery if the target site is downstream of that region where the vortices have emerged. And people have looked at this kind of problems, but in most of the cases, the geometries that folks from the mechanics community have used are idealized. Uh, for example, like a simple T section over here. What I'm trying to do is to think about the anatomically realistic geometries and uh, explore how the vortices might impact uh, drug delivery. So the particular problem that I'm going to discuss here is related to a condition called vocal fold granuloma where there are these little tumors that are formed near the vocal folds in the throat. I have virtually implanted tumors of different sizes and these sizes are, 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 are decided based on my discussion with the clinicians. And then I have run the breathing simulation and then some particle simulations to figure out what are the ideal particulate sizes for targeted delivery around the vocal fold granulomas. And I see that the size range is between eight and 10 microns. Now let's compare that to what we have right now in terms of prescribed drugs. There are the size ranges, one to four microns, quite different than what we see from our modeling work. So this shows you that it is indeed possible to use this kind of fluid mechanics tools to even improve the design of these targeted drugs. And hence, I have a number of collaborations with the drug development companies as well, who want to explore these kind of nuances and use fluid mechanics in their, in their working process. The last project that I wanted to discuss is about uh, bio-inspired mask filters. Uh, here, this is a project that we recently got funding from NSF for. And here we are trying to come up with a design for a novel kind of face covering or filter. And what we are thinking about is this. We know that uh, in the animal world, there are some high olfactory animals, which they have a very complex nasal passage. As a result, when they inhale, they can screen the particulates much more efficiently from that inhaled air, and that helps their sense of smell. Uh, can we use that kind of design in terms of uh, structuring the filter pathway, which will help in trapping the particles, and yet, because it is bio-inspired, the, the pressure drop for the flow through that filter is not going to be that high, because otherwise, that is not going to be supported by evolution of the animals, right? Uh, and while doing so, we are still going to capture the particles that are actually the bad particles for, for disease transmission. And uh, again, the project that I just discussed, what are the bad droplet sizes, can help in figuring out what should be the design of the filter, uh, because we just want to trap those particular particles out. And in terms of the pressure drop, that is a measure of the breathability of the mask. Uh, our main goal is to make sure that the pressure drop through these filters is lower than what we have, for example, from the N95 masks. And that would imply in qualitative terms that uh, the mask is going to be more breathable than the most advanced face coverings that are out there. 
So this is a sample uh, design of the filter pathway. We used a tortuosity value of 1.9. Uh, on the right, you have a single pathway and uh, around 300 of them would go into a circular domain to make the entire filter. So this is a collaborative project. There are other groups uh, who run the experiments. So for example, the the pure flow experiment is being run at Cornell, uh, where they measured the pressure drop across the filter. And uh, at UIUC, they're uh, simulating, they're, they're, they're testing experimentally the, the filtration performance through these filters. Uh, the work that I'm going to show here is uh, basically replicating the experiments that they're running at, at Cornell University. So uh, on the top left, you have their experimental setup. I developed a similar kind of uh, in silico domain that we can run uh, CFD simulations uh, for. And, and, and here we show the pressure drop data for different kind of breathing rates. Uh, as you can see, the pressure drop uh, range varies from very small to around 250 pascals, but still, uh, if you compare them to N95 data, uh, the pressure values are smaller, which in other words imply that these masks are going to be more breathable than the N95s. And uh, the other layer of this project is to filter the particles. So this is the heat map for particle filtration. And you see that uh, the design that we have right now, it can filter the bad particles out most of the time. And this is a sample uh, uh, video for uh, to show you guys where the particles are getting trapped in a single filter pathway. So at the very beginning, the particles are being trapped because of the inertial motion. Uh, and as we go further, the trapping happens because of the fluid mechanics. These are for 3.5 micron particles. So if you think about the particles that are getting trapped uh, further downstream, uh, that is, they are being trapped thanks to the vortices that are emerging on the system and they're being sucked towards the low pressure zones on the walls. And this screenshot tells you uh, the overall trapping trends for different particle sizes. You can see that the, at least this particular filter design did not do a very great job of screening the two micron particles. They did a sort of good job with the 3.5 micron particles and for 10 micron particles, almost all of them were trapped at the very first uh, bend of the design. And, uh, over here, I show some videos to show you the, 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 the general trend of the particle dynamics. So based on the initial location of the particles at the inlet of the filter, they would be trapped or, or, or be able to escape. Uh, so on the top row, I have 3.5 micron particles. At the bottom, I have 10 micron particles. So the 3.5 micron particle got trapped, the one on the top right, but both the 10 micron particles are getting trapped. So, with this, let's wrap up. So as, I, as you can tell from the overall flavor of my research, that yes, I'm, I'm bringing in the fluid mechanics expertise to the table, but uh, to answer these questions, I need inputs, I need expertise from other groups as well. So I work with a number of medical schools. I work with a number of uh, engineering departments, both mechanical engineering and biomedical engineering. I have a number of collaborations with the pharmaceutical industry and uh, on the right, these are my funding sources. I'd like to end with this slide. These are some uh, words from Schrodinger. So he said in this book, What is Life, back in 1944, that uh, we are only now beginning to acquire reliable material for welding together the sum total of all that is known into a whole. So let's think, this is 1944, all of what two is going on. And we are now in 2021. So as engineers, or, or maybe in this group, many of us are engineers, many of us might be physicists or applied mathematicians, we have a lot of sophisticated tools which we can use in many different ways. So for my group, I'm trying to use the tools that I have learned through my academic career to answer these open questions in um, medical science. So with this, let's end this talk and I'd be happy to discuss more. Okay, uh, thank you so much, Sripadha. So we are now open to questions, so formally. So please, uh, you know, feel free to raise your hand or stop us uh, with your questions. So uh, before anybody asks, I have a question. So it's a kind of broad uh, curiosity question. So have you started characterizing the vortices? Like 
we are telling that some underlying vorticity dynamics is responsible for the trapping, right? So no, like, no. Uh, uh, to be frank with you, no, we have not yet. But that's a very good question, and which I want to explore as I move along. So the the challenge over there is, uh, I think you know some of my earlier work on vortex dynamics, where we developed two uh, D potential flow models mm -hmm. for vortex tracks, but that is too idealized of a system to apply in a real world. So uh, these are all pretty flows. So that is going to be a challenging uh, line of research, but something that I want to explore moving ahead. Okay, it will be really interesting. Yeah. Okay, so um, does anybody have any other question? Uh, I can ask something, but this will not be that much step. No, Please go ahead. It's just an informal session. Yeah, uh, Shrigat, it's uh, Shuvan here again. So this is uh, coming from fluid mechanics, and I think Chandan also fluid mechanics. Uh, I think most uh, more closer to what your work was in Virginia Tech because he also works on vortex dynamics. Uh, right. I'm mechanics, but more at a molecular level, and that's why I was asking you the time scale questions before because my simulations are more on the level of uh, nanometer and nanoscale time scales and lens scale. Yeah. Uh, so my questions would be uh, coming from like uh, Dr. Stremler's group, which is like more theoretical water dynamics. Like, uh, at what point did you feel that you want to shift to a more application-oriented research? Uh, was it like just after the PhD uh, you wanted to start searching for application-oriented domain for research to expand your uh, research, let's say domain or expertise? Or and the reason I ask this is because like I'm like planning to wrap up my PhD in a year or so. Right. Looking, looking for postdocs and coming from from a molecular dynamics perspective in fluids, uh, and the way U.S. research uh, plays is like it's a very application in the domain, right? So it's very difficult for uh, theoretical people or uh, let's say pure science people to survive without uh, the any of the the papers. So at what point did you feel uh, that you want to shift to? application or more experiment, experiment you uh, explore experimental as well and sure. what made you choose metal applications uh, to be the field that you want to explore first and maybe you can diversify later as well okay yeah that's a very great question first of all but before i go into my answer you are at purdue right now right i'm at purdue yeah yes I'm yes yeah. So so who are you working? i'm in the aero department i'm working with lee chow we are a combustion lab uh, she is. Uh, she is an experimental person. Or I'm the only computational person in the group. So she mostly works on spray sprays on nanoscale combustions. But I look at. I mostly study phase change and transport properties at uh, molecular level. Right. Okay. Okay. Anyway. So. Uh, well. Uh, yeah, yeah. That's a great question. So let let me try to answer that. So when I was working at Virginia Tech, I was very happy working in those kind of transport economics domains. It was intellectually very challenging and uh, I enjoyed my, my, my dissertation. Uh, but as I was wrapping up, that should be around uh, that should be around end of 2013 and then I graduated in May 2014. While I was wrapping up, I saw from my seniors at that time that uh, I wanted to be a faculty for sure. I did not want to go into uh, 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 industry R&D. So I wanted to be a tenure track faculty, but I saw that if you are just from a theoretical uh, uh, research area, it is difficult to land a tenure track position. So that was my first cue that I need to uh, know a few other things beyond theoretical fluid mechanics. Folks could have landed a tenure track position 20 years back with just a theoretical background, and we know people like them. But uh, I don't think that is possible anymore. You need to diversify your tool sets. Uh, at least that was true for me. So uh, what I was doing was too theoretical in nature, uh, and point vortex dynamics is interesting, but it can only be applied to so many real life problems, right? So. The next thing that I did was I thought that maybe I should learn some experiments because at that time I was still a graduate student. You come under some kind of uh, notions that, oh, it might be easier to run experiments and whatnot, which is not at all true. Uh, so I thought that, okay, let's do some experimental fluid mechanics. I was applying for postdoc positions. I started quite early. Uh, so I was about to graduate in May, 2014. I think I started looking for postdocs uh, 
at least 10 months before that. Uh, eventually, I got lucky. So I was interviewed uh, first on Skype uh, by uh, uh, Mahesh Bandi at uh, uh, OIST, Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology. So I knew Mahesh because he was, he visited us at Virginia Tech as well before. So he interviewed me there and uh, through Skype and then uh, they flew me over to Japan where uh, I gave my research talk and uh, they were an experimental group. So I thought that, okay, let's, let's run some experiments because the project that he proposed for me was uh, Related to vortex dynamics, uh, he proposed that I would have to design a, a, a vertical soap film setup uh, where we can run some VIV experiments. Uh, that was all fine, but the moment I started doing experiments, I realized that I'm not really enjoying myself over there. Uh, but even then, that process helped. So I was there for around a year and a half, and I learned more about the experiments. And hence now, when I uh, work with other groups, I'm not under any kind of notion that experiments are easy. They're difficult, and, and we need to know more about experiments, even if you are a computational guy or if you, even if you're a theoretical guy. So that, 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 that stint helped, but uh, to go back to your question, at what point did I want to diversify? It was the point when I realized that just having one single uh, strength is not sufficient to land a tenure track position. You need to diversify yourself further. But since I did not enjoy experiments, I knew that I need to know something else as well. So that's why I had to go for the second postdoc. So I uh, was applying for different positions and eventually I landed this, this postdoc position at UNC Chapel Hill. It was on computations because of course, as a fluid mechanician, I'm done with theory, I'm done with experiments. So that's the only other option left. So I wanted to do computations for, for sure, but I did not know what would be my application area. So, that was a matter of uh, luck, I would say. I knew that medical science has a lot of open problems and we all know that biomedical uh, sciences, they are going to thrive over the next 20, 30 years. But I did not have any specific uh, uh, decision as such that I'm just going to work in medical problems at that point. And this is 2015, so end of 2015. But I landed that position and I started working with the clinicians. The initial few months were rough because I had to uh, know a lot of things about uh, computations which I have not done before or I had to know a lot of things about the medical anatomy, those kind of things, but it was a good experience because finally I realized that whatever esoteric problem that I was working on in graduate school and for that matter even in Japan, I can now use those tools in something that can directly impact the world around me. That at least for me was uh, uh, a great feeling. Like uh, now I can actually apply my fluid mechanics knowledge in a real life problem. And uh, so I kept on working and uh, then I started developing projects of my own. Uh, and to be frank with you, there are not many people like me in this area where people are working uh, in this kind of respiratory flow problems with a fundamental background in fluid mechanics. Uh, so that gives me some edge. So I would say for people like you who might want to become a faculty later on, try to find that niche area where your strengths might come in and be very effective. While at the same time, do make sure that you build up on at least two or three skill sets, which you can keep on applying to different problems as you move along. Because as a tenure track uh, faculty applicant, you need to present a cohesive story for your uh, application package, a cohesive story for your research program, and all your skills should come in together to design that program for the next three to five years. Uh, yeah, the, thank you so much. Yeah, yeah that does. That does. It, it's, it's good to get a perspective from someone else who has actually walked the path and is, and is actually where what where we want to end up at someday, hopefully. And uh, let me tell you, getting a tenure track position is very difficult. I did not realize that back then. It's 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 really difficult. So be prepared to send out a lot of applications. Yes, yes. And on a on a same note, or let's say on the same line, uh, how much open do you feel professors are? Uh, to accept someone who's from a theoretical or a computational background to allow them to explore something new in a postdoctoral uh, postdoctoral time. I think that is subjective. It depends on the particular PI. Uh, okay. Because uh, yeah, I mean, I mean postdoc should be ideally used to to build up a new skill. Uh, I know many PIs who just uh, try to index someone who already has that skill. Somehow I was lucky, so I got the chance to build up on new skills. Uh, so that is something that you need to consider when you decide on your postdoc position. Okay, uh, thank you so much. I'll, I'll let others ask questions. Thank you so much, Yeah. Uh, yeah. 
Chandan, you are muted. Yeah, so thanks, Suman, for asking. And this was this discussion was very enlightening, actually. So uh, anybody wants to ask any other question related to the talk or outside it? Okay, Manas, do you want to ask a question? Uh, uh, yes, uh, thank you very much. It was really a wonderful pre presentation. Um, um, I have one question regarding regarding the geometries that you prepare. So what software you use for generation of the mesh? Uh, the mesh is being generated on uh, ISM CFT. I see if you okay, okay, okay. Uh, okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so I have a follow up question. Like, um, I mean, I think in CFD community, in this kind of you know, nasal airflow problems, the uh, slicer is uh, very, I would say, very popularly used. So, any in any re particular reason that you are not using it? Uh, not really. So, I have a collaborator, Duke, uh, he is using slicer, uh, okay. and uh, yeah, I mean, that. It works as well. I have just not used it. Like uh, okay. I recently yeah. have a new graduate student who is trying to learn Slicer. Uh, uh, in terms of the modeling framework, uh, it's it's similar to what uh, we have on Mimix. It's it's exactly similar. You have like uh, a coronal view, an axial view, and a sagittal view, and you try to build the model. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So if we do not have any more questions, I think uh, yeah, let's. Uh, thank One last speaker. experience, Jonathan, that I would like to share. Going back to Shuman's question, yes, sure, is, sure, uh, sure. When I was yes. uh, being interviewed uh, during that tenure track cycle, uh, I still remember. I am not going to name the university. It's one of the top ten or one universities where I was invited to for the on-campus visit. It's in the south. Uh, there, the department head, after the interviews, uh, he told me directly that. Uh, uh, the papers that you have written, uh, the ones that you wrote from Point Vortex Dynamics, they will stand probably the test of time. They are the best in quality, but we did not shortlist you or we did not uh, in invite you here because of your that work. We invited you here because of your work in biomedical sciences. There is, but there is a higher chance of getting funding. So this is the reality. So you need to be prepared for that. So make sure that the program that you propose should match your own interest because you cannot just think about funding. It should be of your own interest as well. But still, you need to make it packageable enough to to what the funding venues uh, would like or what uh, your department chair would like. So that's that's just the reality right now out there. Yeah, because that's that, that's what the research market is going through right now. It's just I, I feel like like at least in more theoretical and basic sciences, it's much easier to find let's say like mindset people over in Germany and in Europe who are still happy doing theoretical basic research. But US is such a fast changing and dynamical research market that I guess it needs to change with time. Otherwise it's difficult to yeah. survive. Yeah. I mean personally I don't complain because I like the work that I'm doing. But but uh, oh, no, definitely, if, yeah. you ask, if you ask me like uh, if you ask a 2013 version of me, I would have been very scared because whatever I knew back then was just one for economics. But but it is important that you Really, it's nobody else so that you are yeah. yeah, yeah. Thank you so much for the advices. Yeah. Okay, Prashant, do you want to ask a question? Yes, sir. Uh, uh, I want to remind uh, Professor Saikat uh, to suggest some open sources for the MRI scans for the upper airway tract as well as the lungs. Okay, yeah, I will. I'll, I will do that. I probably don't have your email address, but I can send. Uh, if I find something, I'll send a link to Chandan. Okay, okay please you. uh share uh, please share your email id in this chat or in my you can find my email id from the website of this talk okay. sure sure uh, thanks thanks okay. I I, uh, as i said I, I i did review a paper which i think came out from singapore and uh, i can look it up and if i find something i'll let you know yeah sure uh, thanks uh chandan i'd also be very much interested uh chandan can you hear me yeah, yeah, please. Yeah, I, I'd also be very much interested in that uh, question uh, regarding the open source, um, open source uh, data, uh, data, data, data. Yeah, yeah, That's definitely. Right. So kindly okay. send me that. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I, if Shrikanta sends me, uh, I will share with you guys. And uh, okay. I think you both know my email ID. Uh, just share yeah. your email IDs. I will okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Shrikanta. It was a really good talk. Although, like, I have. 
I know your research, but for the others, I think it was very interesting and uh, hope to see more on the interesting vortex dynamics <laughs> from your work. Thank okay. you. Thank uh, you for inviting me again. Yeah. Yeah. And thanks everyone for joining the talk. And uh, re it's really a pleasure to have you all here. So I'm closing this session. Uh, so probably um, we'll, we'll uh, share the next talks details in the WhatsApp group or what, whatever social media platforms I use. And uh, thank you everyone once again. So I'm closing the talk here. Bye.